Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives for Patrick O'Donnell's talk on his book, new book, The Unknowns, The Untold Story of America's sure. Unknown Soldier and World War I's Most Decorated Heroes Who Brought Him Home. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Whether you're joining us in person or watching us through our YouTube channel, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN audience. Before we bring Patrick up, I'd like to tell you about two other programs that are coming up next week in this theater. On Tuesday, June 12th at noon, the John A. Lawrence will be here to discuss his recently published book, The Class of 74, Congress After Watergate and the Roots of Partisanship. The post-Watergate election of 1974 replaced dozens of Republican House members with reforming Democratic freshmen, and Lawrence examines how the newly elected representatives transformed Congress. And on Wednesday, June 13th at noon, John Reeves explores the changing attitudes toward Robert E. Lee over the last 150 years in an 1865 indictment against him for treason and lost indictment of Robert E. Lee, the forgotten case against an American icon. Book signings will follow both programs. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events at archives.gov. You can check you can um, sign up to receive it by email, online, or there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby as you leave. You'll find information about other National Archives programs and activities also. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. Military records in the National Archives document not only command decisions and military operations, but also the actions of individuals. A number of the, of the records testify to the great sacrifice, death, and combat. The National Cemetery across the river in Arlington, Virginia, is the resting place of more than 400,000 people, including nearly 5,000 unknown soldiers. In 1921, a single unknown soldier was chosen to represent all those who have died without being identified. The soldier of World War I was laid to rest with solemn ceremony attended by the highest ranks of military and civilian leaders. A film in our motion picture, picture holdings documents the progress of that soldier's remains from France to the United States and the newly built Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. As the ceremonies at the U.S. Capitol where the unknown lay in state, General Pershing stood as the soldier's father to fill the role of the nearest relative. Along the way from France to the final resting place, eight men personally selected by General Pershing accompanied the body of the unknown. So we're going to hear from Patrick O'Donnell and learn the story of those eight bearers and their heroism on the battlefield. Patrick O'Donnell is a best-selling, critically acclaimed military historian and an expert on elite units. He's the author of 11 books, including Washington's Immortals, We Were One, and Dog Company. And he is the recipient of several national awards. He served as a combat historian in a Marine rifle platoon during the Battle of Fallujah and speaks often on espionage, special operations, and counterinsurgency. He has provided historical consulting for DreamWorks, award-winning miniseries Band of Brothers, and for documentaries produced by BBC, The History Channel, and Fox News and Discovery. And just to read you a couple of snippets of reviews on this, his newest book from Wall Street Journal. With exhaustive research and fluid prose, Mr. O'Donnell relates, relates both the history of the unknown soldier and the story of America's part in World War I through these soldiers' experience. And from USA Today, a gripping story by Mr. O'Donnell, one of the best military historians of his generation. Few authors have the same kind of enthusiasm and gusto that O'Donnell brings to his topic. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Patrick O'Donnell to the stage. really quite an honor to be introduced by the Archivist of the United States. I've spent two de over two decades here at the National Archiving Archives researching 11 books from the American Revolution all the way to the unknowns. Right here in this building, 
Several of the stories about the Navy body bearers were drawn from the, uh, the research here at the, at the National Archives. I'm really just honored by all the, the individuals that are here today um, that came to support the unknowns, especially many of the uh, former tomb guards. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, Paul Basso, former Sergeant of the Guards, um, as well as Richard Azaro. Uh, if you could please stand. This is, these are some of America's finest. Thank you, thank you so much for your service. Also, Tim Franks of the AMC and uh, the OSS Society and many of my other friends are here and my family, my mom and dad. I really appreciate your support. Thank you over the years. Um, I've written 11 books and all of those books have found me in one way or another. And what I mean by that, it's not a cliche. The, the story finds me. If it's, you know, Washington's Immortals, we're walking, I was walking with the battalion commander I was with in Fallujah, and we found a rusted old sign that said, here lie 256 Continental soldiers, Maryland heroes, who are buried in a mass grave in Maryland, in, in Brooklyn somewhere. And I wanted to know the backstory of that story. It's history in plain sight, and the unknowns is no different. I was given the opportunity to be a guide in France for the 5th Marines and later the Wounded Warrior Regiment. And as we walked the, the battleground, the, the hallowed ground of Bella Wood, which happened exactly 100 years ago to this day, where the Marine Corps and the 2nd Division helped save Paris. They, they stopped the German drive. I mean, we, we look around the news and there's very little talked about the Battle of Bella Wood and that generation of, of, of doughboys. It's the reason why I wrote The, the Unknowns. It's an unknown generation. It's a forgotten generation that changed the world. We're walking around the shell holes of Bella Wood. There's still mustard gas entombed in some of the, the hardwood trees at Bella Wood. The, the land is scarred by World War I. And I was joined by some of the brothers that I was with in Fallujah. And it was quite striking. The two generations had met at one place. And it was a situation where Fallujah nearly killed all of us where the former Ottoman Empire, now Iraq, was, was directly a result of that. It was, it was that, that meeting of generations that, that made me wonder. And then I found out that Ernest A. Jansen made an epic charge on a place called Hill 142. As we walked up to Hill 142, this is the high ground near Bella Wood. It was crucial. The Marines on June 6th, 1918, charged across a, a wheat field under heavy machine gun fire. There were Maxim machine gunners. They charged in Civil War formation because they were ordered to by the French. It was a, you know, it was a bloodbath. Many of these men dropped from the machine gun bullets. They kept charging. They kept making their way towards Hill 142. And for, unbelievably, they were able to take out a position that was held by a battalion of Germans. And they seized the hill. And against all odds, they seized that hill. But within 20 minutes, they knew what was coming next, a German counterattack. And Jansen and George Hamilton with the 49th Company, this book is a band of brothers on the 49th Company as well as the body bearers in this book and the, the story of the unknown soldier, braced for the counterattack. And Jansen saw in the distance nearly a dozen Stahlheim camouflage helmets making their way up towards his position setting up several Maxim machine guns on heavy sleds. He knew if they were able to set those up, they would sweep the hill and take it. He let out a blood-curdling cry and charged forward and stopped the attack, the German attack. He disrupted the entire attack and potentially saved the hill. For his actions, he was the first Medal of Honor recipient for the Marine Corps, but he was also Pershing's body bearer. And when I found that out, I wanted to know who the other men were. It was at that point the unknowns found me. And I spent years uncovering their story, which is an untold story. It's an untold story within multiple untold stories that are hidden in plain sight. The tomb itself has an incredible history, but it's history in plain sight. It's the backstory behind the tomb. Who were the people that were selected to bring back the remains? how the unknown was selected. All of these stories are woven into 
a single story, a narrative history that's very cinematic, that brings you to World War I through the, the eyes of the men, the most decorated enlisted men of the war, who saw some of the toughest action. In, every, in, in nearly every major battle, but General Pershing, when he selected his eight body bearers, selected individuals from the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. And then within that, he selected individuals from the combat specializations of the combat engineers, for instance. And these aren't guys that built things. They blew things up. And in the case of Thomas Saunders, who was a body bearer in this book, who's a Native American, given some of the most difficult assignments of the war, had to breach the wire with only a pair of wire cutters. And breached the wire, making a hole to allow the rest of the infantry to go through. You have the cavalry. It's hard to believe, but there are mounted troops in France. And one of our great stories is body bearer Harry Taylor, who was practically born in the saddle, a cowboy that was raised in Wyoming. And Taylor fought with the 1st Cavalry for, for the, at the beginning of his career, was involved in numerous conflicts, and then found himself in France, training men with the 91st Division, the Wild West Division, who makes an epic charge, a suicide charge, at a place called Gessney in the Argonne, the Meuse Argonne, one of Amar America's bloodiest battles. There's also the infantry, Samuel Woodfill, one of America's most decorated doughboys. There's the heavy guns. I mean, this is a forgotten aspect of World War I. There were, there were rail guns in France and heavy artillery. And one of the body bearers is represented there, Louis Ragsa. The field artillery, a forgotten branch in many ways. These are men that were with, in most cases, French 75s, artillery pieces that moved up with the infantry. In some cases, they were in combat with the infantry as they moved up and, and provided close artillery support as the infantry advanced. This is the story that's in the unknowns. It's, it's try, General Pershing was trying to be very comprehensive in the, the way that, in fair, in the way that he told the story of World War I through the eyes of these men. And then, of course, there's the extraordinary story of the tomb itself and how, it was, how the, the, body, the unknown was selected. And I, fo I follow a Chicagoan, a doughboy, named Char um, Edward F. Younger through the entire war. And Younger was part of the 2nd Infantry Division, an elite unit within the AEF, the American Expeditionary Forces, that fights in some of the greatest battles of the war. And, and Younger is there. He's a doughboy, a regular grunt, a sergeant that fights from battle to battle. He's wounded twice very severely. And then I'll get into the story of how he's selected. It's quite extraordinary. And then there's the story of how all these men and individuals come together here in Washington, D.C. First, on November 9th, 1921, and then they bring this the most extraordinary individual, the unknown soldier, to his final resting place in Arlington, Virginia. Let me just kind of go back a little bit in time, though, and talk about some of these body bearers, because this book is about, about stories. It's about extraordinary stories. It's about a, in, a, extraordinary individuals that, in many cases, did the impossible. And I mean, what, what you, will, you will see in this, this book is individuals that had to overcome extreme hardship. Talking about gas persistently all the time as they fought. Bodies that were covered with, with, with lice and mites and as, they, as they fought through combat because they weren't able to change their uniforms. They also had to battle and fight the greatest army in the world at the time, the German army. But let me go back in time to 1917, when Amar America was unprepared. America went from an army of about 220,000 regulars to an army of over 4 million strong at the end of the war. It's an extraordinary story of growth in a, in a, in a time of, of great need, and we mobilized. 
But par one part of this story is a forgotten story, and that's the story of the Navy in World War I, the American Navy in World War I. And in 1917, in March 1917, President Wilson had a real threat on his hands. German U-boats were sinking American shipping at an alarming rate, even before we entered World War I. There was a decision made to bring naval guards on board merchant ships, to, to arm them with typically five-inch guns and give the, the merchant ship a crew of about 15 naval personnel. These are known as naval guards. And one of those individuals was James Delaney. James Delaney was a, a tough Irishman from Boston, Massachusetts. His body was inked with the ships that he served on. He had been serving since 18. His life was the Navy. And he was given command of a naval gun crew on the, USS, the SS Campana merchant ship. And their, their journey in 1917, in the summer of 1917, actually was going pretty well until midsummer and they were, they were making their way back to the United States and all of a sudden a torpedo nearly hit the ship. It was then quickly followed by artillery fire. The men manned their guns and began to respond. U-boat 61 was crewed by an expert, Diekman, his name was, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Captain Diekman, who had sunk nearly 40 naval ships from the Allies at this point. And now his prey was the USS Campana. James Delaney went into action with his crew. They manned their guns, and they started to fire upon the U-boat. But Victor Diekman, the captain of the U-boat, was, was, was quite who was quite knowledgeable on these affairs and had sunk many Allied ships, he wisely stayed out of range of the Campana's guns. But what ensued was a cat and mouse chase for hours. Both sides fired their guns at each other as the Campana tried to flee the battle space. Eventually, U-boat 61's rounds were able to hit the side of the Campana, one near the engine compartment, James Delaney's men were, were firing so many rounds that their eardrums began to bleed. But they ran out of ammunition, and several of the, of the U-boat shells struck the Campana. Captain Oliver, who's a New Yorker, on the Campana decides to strike his colors and surrender his vessel. The U-boat moves in close. They, they go right by the, uh, the, the actual rowboats that the Campana's crew and James Delaney are in, nearly... Um, wipe them out as they go so close to it. But then they, they have a boarding party that, 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 uh, that goes aboard the, uh, the Campana. They set several charges. And, but before they do that, they raid the food locker on board the Campana. The life on board a submarine was very harsh. They only had canned goods or whatever they could bring aboard once the journey began. The, the journey was also dirty and filthy. The engines on board the U-Boat uh, 61 let off uh, a lot of grease, and there was inside the boat, there was something called U-Boat sweat. Literally, condensation would be inside the boat, and it would get on, on, uh, on the, uh, the men's clothes, in their coffee, in their food, everything. So remarkably, the first thing that they did when they went on board the Campana was look for soap. <laughs> And they went for the soap, and they tried to clean themselves off, and they got the food. And they also looked for anything of intelligence value, and they detonated the ship and sank it. And at that point, the men, including James Delaney, were, were brought on board. Six of these men were brought on board U-Boat 61. And the captain is a remarkable figure. He speaks perfect English, and he begins to question James Delaney. And here is a a meeting of two men. They both, they, they become, I wouldn't say there's a friendship formed, but there's a, res, a mutual respect that's formed, including the respect with the crews. Because the men, James Delaney's crew and his men endure what the men of the U-boat endure. And if you've ever seen the movie Das Boat, it's an American, it's a World War II uh, version of a U-boat under sea, but this is, in a, this is a World War I DOS boat of what James Delaney goes through. And the men of the U-boat 61, including Victor Deepin, they're, they're depth charged. They have to, um, they, have, they endure what's known as a cube, cube boat, literally a merchant ship 
that the Allies have that is actually a warship that's disguised as a merchant ship, but it's, it's designed to, as soon as the U-boats surface, to basically reveal hidden guns and attack the U-boat. Um, they go through a minefield, and it's just an extraordinary story. I won't tell the entire story, but I will tell you that at the end of the voyage, both crews lined up for a photo. And what James Delaney didn't know and the other Americans that day was that U-Boat 61's crew were all walking dead men because within a matter of weeks or months, they would never be seen again. This is the powerful stories that are inside the unknowns that, that took me years to unearth, including here. Some of these stories were found here in the National Archives as I unearthed them. Another incredible story is the story of the 49th Company of the Marine Corps. The helmet next to me is not the 49th Company. It's actually 2-5, uh, um, which is 2nd second, second Battalion, 5th Marines. But their story really begins at Bella Wood, which happened exactly 100 years ago to this day. I mentioned the, the, the epic charge on June 6th where the men, this was in a World War I D-Day that nobody's ever heard about practically unless you're in the Marine Corps or unless you're a World War I buff. This is where the Marine Corps advanced across several fields under heavy machine gun fire. But what happened before that was quite extraordinary. At the end of May, early June, the Germans had launched a major offensive geared at Rome or I mean, sorry, at, at, um, at Paris. And they were breaking through the French lines. Literally, the French army was melting away. The, 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 the archives talk about how it was like water on a hot iron. It was just evaporating. The French army was evaporating. Men from the 49th Company and 2-5 and the Marines in the 5th and 6th Regiment, as well as the 2nd Division, were all being trucked as quickly as possible, along with the third division of the US Army into the vortex of battle to hold the line at all costs. These were some of the only reserve units at the time. And they were, in many cases, super divisions. The US divisions were about twice the size of a French division, and sometimes even more than, uh, even larger than a, Ger much more larger than a German division. They were quickly rushed to the front and as they were in their, their trucks or their camions, they saw French civilians passing them by, and as well as French the members of the French army, some cases throwing down their weapons, saying that the war is over. These men push, pushed forward into the front. And it was here that Lloyd Williams from 2-5, from the men set up behind parts of the French army near Belleau Wood. And a decision was made by Colonel Preston Brown, who was the chief of staff of the 2nd Division. The French wanted to immediately commit the Marine Corps and the, and the Army piecemeal, basically fr thrust them into the, into the line. And he insisted that they be able to dig in behind the French in shallow foxholes and wait and prepare a, a small defensive line. This potentially helped save the war, this decision, because the Marines and the, and the Army were ready as the Germans advanced across the, the wheat fields, the, the French were fleeing. And according to the Marine Corps' lore, as, as well as other documents, Lloyd Williams with 2-5 was confronted with this dilemma. And he said, retreat, hell, we just got here. And they dug in, and they began to fire with, with their rifles, accurate rifle fire. Most Marines were marksmen. They were able to take down the Germans as they advanced across the wheat. They stopped them, and then on June 6th, the Allies go on the attack. The French order them to push forward. And it's Jansen's company, the 49th Company, which I follow through the entire war, is advancing through the wheat field to their objective, the first objective, which is Hill 142. They seize the hill against all odds. I mean, many of these men are killed as they cross the wheat field. They take the hill. Jansen sur survives, is badly wounded, but survives. He's able to disrupt the attack. And then these men fight. The 49th Company 
fights through the entire war. And they're in the major, the major battles that the AEF fights in. About a month after Bella Wood, it takes several weeks. It takes about three weeks to clear Bella Wood. And what happens is a newspaper reporter, Floyd Gibbons with the Chicago Tribune, is with the Marines in the field as they advance on the 6th. He's shot through the eye, and, but before he goes, he writes his report. And the censors, um, are, it's absolutely forbidden to provide any kind of unit de designation of who's in the field. But the censors believe that, that Floyd Gibbons is killed on the, on the field. He's shot through the eye, he's badly wounded. They don't know it, but he's, he's actually alive, but they believe that he's dead. And they believe, they, they, so they go, okay, we'll let, we'll let Floyd's report go through, which identifies the Marine Corps. And all of a sudden, the papers all read that the Marine Corps helped save France <laughs> and Paris. Of course, it's the Army as well. But it creates a sensation. It goes viral. And it, what, what happens is Bella Wood, instead of just a local attack, takes on nation significance. The Germans see the papers. And they rush their best units into Bella Wood to try to crush the Marine Corps. And over the course of three weeks, there's very, very heavy fighting and casualties. But ultimately, the Marine Corps and the Army prevail at Bella Wood. And the 49th Company continues to advance. And they fight at, a, you know, at a place called Soissons, which is a turning point in World War I, where the Allies go on the, on the counterattack or the counteroffensive. And they're able to turn the tide of battle there. And the Germans... The, the war is changing, the changing nature of the war. The 49th fights through um, another battle at San Mihel, where the Americans go on a true offensive to take down a salient at San Mihel. Several of the body bearers are involved in the same battle. And one of the, my favorite stories in this book is a forgotten battle that the Marine Corps fought in. It was one of their bloodiest battles, even in some cases, more bloody than June 6th. It was a place called Blancmont Ridge, where the French army insisted that they take the second division to, to somehow seize an impregnable fortress called Blancmont. And here at Blancmont, it's called Blancmont because the, the, um, the face of the mountain is white. It's a white mountain, it shows. But White Mountain was deceptive in the sense that it was ringed with, with hundreds of machine gun nests, artillery positions. For over three and a half years, the French army had tried to take this impregnable fortress, this guns in Navarone. Nothing worked. There were bodies littered all over the place. There was an attack that was only days earlier. The French army failed to try to take it. They called in the 2nd Division, as well as the 49th Company of the Marine Corps, 1-5 is what they were part of to assault this position. Here was also another member of this book, Edward Younger, the Chicagoan. And all of these body bearers, many of them converge on Blancmont, the field artillery, for instance, the combat engineers, the our infantry. Their, their stories all converge as they attack this seemingly impregnable position. They have to go across a mile of open ground. The bodies of the French are littering the area. They, they literally go by one of the positions which was shaped in a phalanx or an arrow. It's all dead Frenchmen. At the tip of the phalanx is a Frenchman with a beard, a large Frenchman with a beard that is, has his wi eyes wide open with his bayonet pointed at the Germans in horror. They pass them and they continue to attack and it's a remarkable story. They seize Blanc Bont on the first day, and then they go over the ridge the next day, and they continue to fight in a position known as the box. It was a natural kill zone that the Germans had created, and men of the 49th Company were, were stuck in this position, and they were shelled mercilessly with high explosives. Or, um, machine gun bullets pelted them in gas. And they were, they were in this position as they try to attack the German line. And it's an extraordinary story of, of heroism and courage um, when, in many cases, they're, um, they're outnumbered. And they, 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 they hold. 
and eventually um, the position is, is consolidated. And one of my, my body bearers, um, the Native American, Thomas Saunders, is pushed into the line as a scout. And he scouts up into the early position, in the early position to penetrate the wire again. But these are just some of the stories that are in the book. And I think, I think Saunders is an extraordinary story. He, he um, receives the French Croix de Guerre uh, and the attack at Blancamont Ridge, where he has to go against a very fixed position um, uh, that the Germans have, have uh, at the end of this field. And uh, Native Americans were unfortunately subject to many of the stereotypes during World War II. They were looked at as, um, as Im Im amazing warriors. And in that sense, they were given some of the most difficult combat assignments. And Saunders wasn't an exception. He was given the, this, the assignment of a, a scout in this position in this, at Blancmont Ridge, but also as a wire cutter to cut the wire and, and use these small handheld wire cutters to breach a hole in the wire to allow the rest of the infantry to go through. And if I go back a little bit, about a month, at San Mihel, he was told to breach the wire there across no man's land. I, I mean, I, I can't even imagine this. Going across no man's land alone with just maybe a partner, one man, and they were given the wire cutters to, to cut a hole, this forlorn hope to cut a hole or breach a hole in the wire. They make it through the wire, and they are the the, the the, the closest, they're the, the, uh, they advance further than any other Allied troops. They keep pushing forward, and they were able to, it's a quite extraordinary, they, they, they make it to a German um, headquarters position that's in a, a castle deep behind German lines, and they're able to capture 63 German soldiers single-handedly through their efforts. But these are the stories that are in the unknowns, and I'll talk about one more story in the book, and that's the story of Charles Leo O'Connor, who's also with the Navy. And Charles Leo O'Connor is given one of the lowliest jobs in the Navy. He's a water tender on the USS Mount Vernon. And the Mount Vernon is a captured German jet vessel. In World War I, we had very little American shipping. It was, it was diminished. It was almost at Civil War levels in some cases. There was a great need for shipping. We needed to take the American troops and the American army that we were building over to France. And there was a, a race to quickly build ships. But another thing that's quite curious that isn't really documented in many places is that there were a number of German vessels that tried to find safe harbor in the United States at the beginning of the war. They knew that the United States was a neutral nation. They were afraid of France and England's navies as they crossed the Atlantic. So they tried to find safe harbor in the United States. And one of those was the SS Crown Prince Castle. It was a, um, a German vessel that was nearly the size of the Titanic. It was an ocean liner. But the, the, it, the German vessel also had a, a hidden secret. It was carrying millions of dollars of gold bullion from Germany. They capture the, 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 the ship goes in to bar, near Bar Harbor, Maine, and it's seized by the government. And the crew and the passengers are interned. And for a year, the ship languishes. And eventually, it's just a little too tempting of a target. The ship's seized along with all the gold. And the, gold, the ship is renamed the USS Mount Vernon, a Navy ship, a troop transport. And Charles Leo O'Connor is assigned to the ship. The ship makes multiple voyages across the Atlantic. In September 1918, they're making one of their, their fifth or sixth voyage across the Atlantic. They're carrying troops from the American Expeditionary Force that are wounded. Many of these men are wounded. They're carrying a congressman, but they're also carrying the plague. Influenza is running rampant across the decks of the USS Mount Vernon. Things look pretty good, though, in the sense that they've somewhat contained the virus, 
even though many of the crew members are, are falling victim to it. But the voyage looks pretty good on the way back. They've never had any kind of hostile activity up until this point. And then all of a sudden that morning, there's a rainbow. And to the experienced mariners of the Mount Vernon, it's an ominous sign. And literally, sure enough, about an hour later, a torpedo slams into the side of the Mount Vernon, rupturing a massive hole in the boiler where, where Charles Lee O'Connor is tending the boilers. He's shoveling coal. His body, he's a mountain of a man, massive, um, bait, built on, on fact, he's shoveling coal every day in this hot furnace-like hellish environment of the Mount Vernon. Thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of water are rushing into the compartment. His body is nearly burned alive by the, by the, the boiler, the cinders that are coming out of the hot coals that are coming out of the boiler. He's being hit by massive amounts of water. He's got to make a split second decision. There are men inside of his compartment. There's also a water tight door that needs to be closed. Does he save his life? Does he save the men in the compartment or does he save his ship? And that is the dilemma that I will leave you with. <laughs> You'll have to read the book. But these men all come together. They come together on the field of battle in some cases. The final night of the war, four of these body bearers come together. They also come together on November 9th, 1921, for the to bring back the remains of the unknown soldier. The unknown soldier in World War I and our unknown soldier is not our own concept. France and England were the first. And in 1921, they established uh, Tombs of the Unknown Soldiers to honor all that had fallen. It was a, an opportunity to, to recognize all that had fallen. It was an, also an opportunity to provide closure for those nations and the sacrifices that they had made. We didn't have one in the United States. There was a hope that all 2,200 Americans that were unidentified or unknown could be identified. The Army blissfully believed that that was possible. It wasn't until 1920 that an editor from a very popular women's magazine, Marie Maloney, who had, was the editor of The Delineator, the mademoiselle of its age, suggested to the War Department that we need an unknown soldier, that we need something that represents all that had fallen, all of those who had fallen from the American Revolution to World War I, to provide closure. It's about who we are as Americans. She was able to convince the War Department, but also she created a movement. The New York Times picked up on the story, the AP, and a young congressman named Hamilton Fish from New York City, who was a white officer in what was known as the Harlem Hellfighters. This was a segregated African-American and Puerto Rican unit that fought bravely and heroically in France. Fish decided it was time to recognize his men and all of those, all of those who had fallen in World War I and spearheaded a campaign to get through the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier got through the funding and the bill, President Wilson signed it, the year goes by and it's 1921. The four major cemeteries in France which contain unknown soldiers, are, uh, uh, the remains are removed from each of these cemeteries. At Bella Wood, at Saint Mihiel where Saunders and all the other men fought, at the Meuse Argonne where many of these men battled, the sum, the four remains are removed. They're carefully checked to make sure that there are no dog tags, letters, diaries, anything that identifies these individuals. And then at that point, the graves registration people burn the tickets that reveal where these, these individuals were, were actually removed from. So it's impossible to identify who these individuals are. The four remains are brought back to Chalon, France, where a French honor guard greets them along with other dignitaries. They are placed in City Hall 
they're flag draped, and there's a procession. The next day, the unknown will be selected. And the plan is initially to have a general officer from the United States make the selection. At the last second, though, the French say, we used a regular grunt, a man that just had been through the trenches, that had been through this hell. There were six men that were escorting the body that night, including Edward F. Younger from Chicago. Each of these men had revealed their, their records of service during the war. And that night, Edward Younger was selected to choose the unknown soldier. He woke up that morning and had this awesome responsibility on his shoulders. The man that had been through with the 9th Infantry, near Vaux, near Bella Wood, through the attack at Blancmont, the hell there, at the final day of the, of the war where they crossed the Meuse, this doughboy that had seen it all was given a bouquet of white roses. Chopin's funeral dirge was playing in the background. The floor of the room was littered with white petals and Edward F. Younger slowly walked into the room and nervously wasn't sure where to, who to select. He made a quick prayer. I found the original notes and typewritten account from Edward Younger at the National Archives and the National Personnel Record Center, which reveals exactly what he felt and how he felt as he walked nervously in between the, the caskets. He looked at the flag and said that was sublime. As his hand, as after he said the prayer, his hand was guided towards one casket. And it was, it was an almost immovable action. He just, he was guided there. He felt that the man in the casket was somebody that he went over the top with. He knew that man in that doughboy. And that was our unknown soldier. And at that point, it, the selection was made. The body was moved to Lahar, France, where the great ship, the USS Olympia, was waiting. And the men brought the, the casket on board the USS Olympia. The Olympia made the voyage across the ocean, the Atlantic, to the Washington Navy Yard. We're right here at the pier, it's still here. The pier is still here from the, on the Washington Navy Yard where on November 9th, the eight body bearers assembled and they removed the casket. The, the picture on the, fo the photo on, top, on the jacket is this exact moment that I'm describing. The casket was, was greeted by the body bearers, General Pershing, President Harding, and other dignitaries, and it was brought to the rotunda where it lay in state. And then on, on November 11th, the same day that the war to end all wars ended, November 11th, the body was removed by the body bearers, placed on the same caisson that carried President Lincoln, and they made the journey on foot to Arlington National Cemetery. And here, in this procession, was a remarkable procession. All of the Medal of Honor recipients from World War I were there. The men, many of the Civil War veterans that had received the Medal of Honor were present, walking in procession. President Harding was there, Wilson was there. General Pershing, who was supposed to be mounted on a, on a white horse, decides to walk as a common mourner behind the casket. And the men bring the casket to, to Arlington and here, this is, this is meant to bring groups in the United States together. History is meant to heal. And the great stakeholders in the country, the NAACP, the DAR, the various for, for, uh, members of government, and even the French, the heads of state, all come. They present their finest honors, their greatest medals. Of The Medal of Honor is presented to the unknown. Words are said. The body is brought to, the, to Arlington Cemetery and it's lowered into the ground. And one of the final people to speak 
is an American Indian, Chief Plenty Clues. It's meant to heal the entire moment. A man that had fought the U.S. government and Thomas Saunders, whose father had fought and grandfather had fought the United States government, who had now served, were laying to rest in our greatest memorial, the unknown. Dirt was shoveled from France into the, into the open hole, and the body was, was laid to rest. And this is our greatest war memorial. This is who we are as Americans. It's also about a forgotten generation, the World War I generation that changed and remade the world. And that's why I wrote The Unknowns. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take your questions. Hi, very good talk. Thank you very much. Um, am I correct in saying that the supposedly unknown soldier from Vietnam was yes. subsequently identified, right? Like in the 1990s, like through DNA testing, like they, yes. they opened um, up the casket. There, the, is the is there any chance that could happen with the supposedly unknown soldier from World War I? I the, 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 um, the unknown from Vietnam was identified um, at the family's behest. They, they felt strongly that that, that individual was their son. And DNA analysis was performed, and he was re-interned um, re with full military honors and identified. And I think it's, it's unlikely that there is um, that, you know, proper DNA in, in the databases to identify the unknown from World War I. There's possible uh, contamination and degradation. I mean, there's a lot of issues. But the biggest thing is this is about this is a national symbol. It's who we are as Americans. It's why we fight. It's, it represents who we are. And I don't think that it's, I think that that's why it's incredibly important. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, Pat. Congratulations uh, on your book's success and for saving this really important part of our, our nation's military history. My question doesn't pertain uh, strictly to the unknowns, but I, I do have a question. Does your book make any mention of the legendary uh, fighting 69th Infantry Regiment? or uh, Colonel William Donovan, who received the Medal of Honor in World War I, and would go on to lead the Office of Strategic Services, predecessor to CIA and the U.S. Special Operations Command in World War II. It does. The book's title is um, Some of the Greatest Heroes That Brought Him Home, but it also includes some of the greatest heroes of the war. This includes Sergeant York, Charles Whittlesey with the Lost Battalion, and also Colonel Donovan in the Fighting 69th. The second division fights in his area, where in the Meuse-Argonne, this, this is America's largest battle of World War I, and also one of its most bloody battles, too. The, the, you know, if you picture this, the opening scene of saving Private Ryan, that's what these guys had to go through. They were fixed positions, they were bunkered, there were machine guns, barbed wire, they had to cross it. And Colonel Donovan in the Fighting 69th, Father Duffy, and many of these other extraordinary individuals had to cross this field. And they're, they're taken out um, in many cases. It's very, very tragic. John, Donovan is shot in the leg. The book chronicles his experience there. And what's extraordinary and interesting is that this experience changes his life. It, you know, instead of frontal assaults, he feels that there's a better way and a more, that will cost less lives. And in World War II, General Donovan is first the coordinator of information, which is the precursor, predecessor to the OSS, which is the predecessor, which most people don't realize, it's the predecessor to most of America's special operations forces. And this is born in the trenches by General Donovan's activities. His, his ideas, his, what, what motivated him comes from his experience in World War I. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the US Army Special Operations Forces, the Green Berets, their direct heritage comes from the operational groups and the Jedburgh teams from World War II. 
These are many of these are, are Donovan's ideas in, in, himself. The OSS Maritime Unit is the Navy SEALs. I wrote a book called The First SEALs, which chronicles their extraordinary story where you know, a medical student from the University of Pennsylvania who tinkers in the summer with old gas masks and bicycle pumps develops the first operational rebreather for the United States. And the Navy SEALs are born literally in a pool at the Shoreham Hotel only a few blocks away from here, which has the largest indoor pool and they test the rebreather. Jack Taylor, a dentist from Hollywood, California. Um, HM, HMG Woolsey, who, uh, Woolley, who's a um, screenwriter for Paramount, but also a royal commando and a liaison officer with the British government. They all come together, this eclectic group of individuals, to develop, to develop the first SEALs. It's an extraordinary story. Taylor even survives a German concentration camp after he parachutes behind the lines. But the, the, uh, the story of the OSS is a story that's hidden here in the National Archives. I spent 20 years uh, digging through, um, you know, literally cubic miles of records, some that had never been seen that, um, since the war, to, to reveal these extraordinary stories. Thank you. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the tradition of the silent uh, guard? Was that... Uh, done it simultaneously when uh, the unknown soldier was rested, or what's the background from the perspective of that? The, you know, in, in 19, right after World War I, there wasn't a tomb guard. There was basically the tomb was there. People could picnic there, and it, they vandalized it. And then in the 1930s, there was a tomb guard. I, I think that it's better if I let one of the people that are, that are some of our finest Americans sort of answer that story. Richard, would you like to sort of take that on? When it started, was it a tradition from Europe? It was mentioned about France and British had unknown soldiers, so the U.S. has that, other countries have that. is American. That the idea of an unknown, as Patrick has mentioned, started with France, Britain, and then the United States. And other countries followed as well. But the, the tomb guard, uh, as you see it, is a strictly an American tradition, and it's United States Army. Uh, it begins, just as Patrick mentioned, at first there was no need for any protection. Uh, but as time went on, people began to treat it as a place to visit and then picnic and even sit on it. And it was one gentleman, uh, I believe he was a Navy officer, witnessed it, literally went over to the White House. At back, time, back then, you can just go over and visit the president. <laughs> and he said a few things to him, which started the guarding process, which was first a civilian guard and then the United States Army is, is chosen to take over the, uh, the military uh, honor guard. What year was that? 1936. I'm going to say, was it 37? 36. I have the uh, former sergeant of the guard to remind me of the dates. Uh, the first civilian guard is 1925, military 26, 27. They start a 24-hour guard. I, I think it's also important to just recognize that this is a 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week activity in any weather situation. You know, Richard, can you just sort of describe some of the things that you endured uh, that, I mean, even a bee sting? <laughs> well, the bee sting. Um, um, this gets into what it's like to be a, a member of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I was there from 1963 to 1965. And um, you have the intensive training, uh, and, uh, and that is intense in many uh, different levels, uh, mental, emotional, physical. Uh, but then they prepare you for what you will experience, or what they think you will experience while you're on the mat. It's what happens to you out there that really starts to shape you, finally, as what we refer to among ourselves as tomb guards. Um, Examples would be, as Patrick reminds me, um, I, on occasion, uh, 
walking in the summer hours, as I was beginning to cross the mat, I was uh, stung by a bee on my ear. And uh, as I mentioned to Patrick, uh, I've never, I never experienced pain like that then or ever since. My head literally exploded with pain. But because of the kind of training that you have, and you have a very profound understanding of who you are and what you're there for, you, you, don't, you don't break. We take great pride in the fact that we never break and we never quit. And we are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But having said all that, there's two things I'd like to quickly say, and that's one, this is nothing compared to what our men and women experience in combat. As tough as it gets out there and challenging it is, and the second thing, and the most profound thing is, it's not about us. It's about them. We are representatives of the American people. What is going on about the, out there and what this is really all about is the sacred duty of the American people to never, ever forget those who have served and sacrificed in times of war or conflict. And we will never forsake those who are out there yet and we haven't found them. That's what this is really all about. And it's about what defines us, Patrick said it, defines us as Americans because what we really are projecting is the question of why. What is it that connects us to those who serve today and those who served in the American Revolution? Lincoln talked about it at his uh, electric cord, in his electric cord speech. It's the principles that are defined in our, our, our founding documents and that's what really connects us, and that's what's really going on out there. We appreciate the recognition for our service. We're very proud of that. There's no mistaking that. We are. But we're also humbled by that trust. Thank you. It's beautiful. I just like to say, uh, I just met Richard two weeks ago, and I, um, I met him on a radio show, and it was the Kojo Anatomy show, and uh, the, uh, NPR. And, he just came up to me and he said, I'd like to shake your hand. Been wanting to shake your hand for two years. Like, oh, really? I read your book, Washington's Immortals. And I was, I was blown away by that. But then he said, I, I, I travel by an old house every day. And that old house contained one of Washington's greatest immortals, Gassaway Watkins. And Watkins was a statuesque, you know, over six feet two uh, in height, member of the Maryland line that had fought in every major battle of the, of the American Revolution and fought in the American Thermopylae in Brooklyn where there's still a mass grave of these, Amer these incredible Americans. But he noticed in one little line of the book the name of Watkins home. And it was a sort of a footnote almost. He didn't realize it, but that was the house that he had been passing every day for years. He went to the house, he went near the house and covered in brambles and bushes was Gassaway Watkins' grave that had been hidden in plain sight, history hidden in plain sight for all these years. He organized uh, you know, an Eagle Troop and others and on Memorial Day we went home and we talked, you know, we spent some time with Gassaway Watkins and we honored his grave and the Eagle Scouts erected a flagpole. For me, that's what this book, The Unknowns and Washington's Immortals is all about. It's about who we are as Americans. It's about recognizing history in plain sight. It's about the backstory behind history that we pass every day. I'll take the next question. Okay, sir, um, I, I enjoy immensely learning all about the Tomb of the Unknowns. And as someone else asked, thinking about the same question I did, you mentioned there were four and unknowns. This gentleman picked one. What happened? Where are, are the where are, are the other three now? The other three have been reburied, um, and they're they're marked as unknown soldiers that were that were the part of that that ceremony. In the same they're place. In France. They're in the in same France. place, or do they go. They're back all to in the same place, in in France, and their their graves are they're next to each other, and uh, yeah, it's, I haven't visited their graves, but they're, they're, they're still there. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more? We're out of time? Okay. Well, thank you very much for...
There's a book signing one level of it. The archive book store.